cold ice water and we gave them some water and uh, they've been coming to church ever since. So uh, you just never know. Uh, Jesus has got living water and uh, everybody's thirsty. So uh, it's just good to see everybody. Uh, we like to welcome you. And uh, if you're a guest here this morning, we've got a gift box out here on the table. Before you leave, we want you to grab a, one of the gift boxes for your family. And we want you to just settle in and have a good time this morning. Um, I'll tell you, if, you're, if you are a guest here this morning, we've got envelopes in the back of the chairs. And we've got an offering table out in the foyer, and uh, we want you to give with a cheerful heart. I've got scripture here I want to get us opened up with this morning, and I usually just read our verse we adopted when we planted the church, but I want to read the whole thing today. Um, we're blessed. Percy Young and his church is doing uh, uh, service right now at the fairgrounds, so there's people sitting out there in 80 degree weather right now, really hot and fanning themselves, and we're here in the air conditioning. But I was going to do this uh, scripture if I needed to go do that fair service this morning, because it includes farmers. It says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. Some of us in here have been around gardening and farming, and we understand that uh, a kernel of corn can produce one and sometimes two ears. And a normal ear of corn has got 14 to 16 rows on it. There's right in the neighborhood of 700 to 800 kernels on that ear of corn. So you can plant one kernel of corn and get close to 700 back. Now, only God could think up something like that and, and cause that to happen. And you say, okay, Pastor Mike, that's cool, but I'm not a farmer. Well, listen to this. It says, but the one who plants generously, generously will get a generous crop. And then he goes in to, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. He's gone from that farmer sowing to talking about us. Everybody is a human being in giving. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. And I want to emphasize that because God blesses us to share it with others, church. I, it, it fascinates me driving down the road and looking at storage buildings. I know I've brought this up for the last month, but I can't get it out of my mind. We're a land of storage buildings. And it says those who build barns to store, uh, they're in sad shape. God blesses us to give. I will always have, or you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. I looked up and we gave uh, uh, pretty close $600 away this week in assistance. And I could have given another $1,600 away uh, without using discernment. So the needs out there, and Scripture tells us the poor will always be among us. So we're always going to have a job to do. He says, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. And you know what? We hang on to the money we get. You don't know how many people come in here needy and ask for help and say, you know what? If I was to put $10 in that offering, I wouldn't have food this week to eat. And I said, no, that's not true. God will supply you with all you need. If you release, he'll supply. 
And I want us to remember that closed fist. When, when we have a closed fist, we can't give anything away. But there's one bigger problem than that. We can't receive anything either. The second you open your hand to give, God has an open hand to pour out blessings that you can't even begin to contain because your hand's open. It's a beautiful principle. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take our, your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. See, God wants, He just wants the glory and the honor. That's all He's asking for. So two things will result from this ministry of giving. Giving is a ministry, church. Every one of you have a ministry. Two things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jer Jerusalem, which is the church even, will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. So God wants you blessing other people and the needs being met, and then he wants the glory for it. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God for you or for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Jesus. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overwhelming grace God has given to you. See, people even pray for you in return for giving. I don't know about you, but I need all the prayer I can get. Thank God for this gift to want too wonderful for words. Beautiful scripture, and we rarely read the whole thing. We just say, come in here, prepare to give with a cheerful heart. And we've never taken an offering up here at Destiny since we planted the church. We've always just allowed you to come in here with a cheerful heart and fill an envelope out and put it in the offering table. So that's our lesson this morning. Worship is special to the church. It's the time we come together in unity. It's a corporate uh, entity. And I, I just love it when we can come together and uh, lift our voices. I know last week Chuck and Val were with Jen and, and Mark doing worship. And Chuck said, now you're not going to make me sing all by myself a cappella again, are you? And I said, no, I, I won't use that again. But... Um, you know, uh, praise and worship to God, as is, is we've just heard in, in our offering message, is, is all he wants. And it's so beautiful to hear the voices and everybody to, together. So right now, uh, I just want us all to surrender to the Lord. Every one of us have different things going on in our lives and, and different callings and different giftings. And uh, I just want us to totally surrender to him right now. And uh, we're going to have Roy and John come up here and... Uh, lead us into worship. Uh, I just want to lay our troubles and our worries down at, at Jesus' feet this morning. He's the only one that can help us through our trouble. So Lord, uh, we just come to you this morning so thankful and grateful uh, that Roy and, and uh, John have come this morning to use their gifting. Uh, Lord, uh, Every one of us in the room here are here to praise you and give you glory and honor for all that's happened this week. Uh, Lord, some of it's been sweet, some of it's been bitter, but we know that you're God Almighty and you're in the midst of everything we set out to do. So Lord, uh, I just ask you to be with us as we praise and worship and give you glory and honor. And we're going to thank you ahead of time for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, uh, Johnny, could, could you just, before you guys get into worship, could you just kind of play a little something soft? I want to call Jim and Carrie up here. Uh, they've got a special little blessing this morning, and uh, we want to pray over them and uh, let them introduce this precious uh, little gal to you this morning. Uh, you talk about prayer and uh, faithfulness. This is one way that God shows his favor. Uh, I'm going to let Jim uh, have the mic here, and he can introduce this precious old gal and share a little bit of whatever is on his heart. And, uh, what a precious family here. Good morning. Um, I'm not going to say too much because I, I won't be able to. These are my girls.
shared this morning um, with Mike and uh, Austin. We were talking about um, just some hardships we've had. And something that's been on our heart this whole journey is, um, oh my goodness, uh, this is nuts. Um, this is hard. It, uh, what are we going to do? Um, but about two days before we left the hospital, one of the nurses walked in, and I was just sitting with little Everly Lynn, uh, feeding her. And she walked in, and she looked at me, and she said, you know, when I first met you, I thought you were a little bit out of your mind. Because <laughs> I told her, you can go through and explain everything. But we, we read all the stuff. We, we've gone through it. We Googled everything. We kind of know what to expect, so if you want to save the time, you don't have to tell us. We just know we're going home on Independence Day. And she looked at me and she said, I, I really thought you were out of your mind. This process takes time, and that's too quick of a time for you to leave. And you guys are going home. We made it home on the 3rd to celebrate Independence as a family, um, and it was awesome. And to look back now, all of our footsteps were ordered, and all we had to do was be faithful and walk them. And it was easy. Really, looking back now, it was easy. <laughs> yeah, some days were easier than others. This is Everly Lynn Eggering. She was born June 18th at 7.29 in the morning in South Jordan, Utah. She's uh, She spent 15 days in the NICU before we got to bring her home. Poor little girl. She was no, no longer out of the hospital. And she went right from the hospital to a Walmart, then, then to the airport to come home. So um, we made it home. Praise God. She's healthy. She's ours. We're so blessed. Thank you all for your prayers, your support. It's an amazing journey. We got a lot to share, but not this morning. Thank you. That's uh, that's really awesome. And I told told them when they would talk to me and, and text, and we we were checking back and forth and. and problems that arise, that it's spiritual warfare. Uh, this little child was destined to die under the circumstances. And when God's hand of favor is in it, and he spares a little child, and they're going to get raised in the name of Jesus, Satan hates that. And he fights right up to the very last second to kill, steal, and destroy. And, and we just see the, the blessing here. And, and we talked this morning about some scripture and spiritual covering. That little girl was covered in that mama's womb from the time that they found out about it and adopted her. She couldn't lose because she had Jesus already. And Satan hates that church. So uh, we're so grateful and thankful that Satan lost a, a precious little gal here and blessed his family with a... A beautiful young girl, uh, you Sunday school teachers, look what you got. <laughs> Teach your heart out. So we're going to pray over them. Uh, as many of you know, adoption is horrific in price. And if, if it would lead you to, to give them some money from uh, time to time, they're not asking for it. They'll probably knock me out when this is all over, but I'm just telling you. That if you get a couple dollars ahead and you feel like blessing, bless the little Everly. And uh, she's got a good home. They've got everything they need. But uh, it would be cool to, to just bless them. So, Lord, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We're so thankful for Jim and Carrie and, and, Carrie and Adia. But, Lord, we've got Everly. What a beautiful little girl. And uh, we're so thankful that you uh, you healed her quickly and got her home. 
Uh, Lord, she has a good life ahead because we know that Jim and Carrie are going to raise her with all their heart and might as, uh, as she grows up and becomes a good, lovable, beautiful young lady. And Lord, I've already got the ball bat picked out for Jim to protect her with. So uh, Lord, we're just going to put this, this family into your will and into your care. I pray a hedge of protection around their home around their finances, Lord, everything they set out to do, we know that you're going to cause it to prosper. And we're going to thank you ahead of time for it all in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Church, that's as good as it gets. Okay, Lord, I'll leave you alone now, Lord. Good morning. I guess please rise and worship with us. <coughs> I don't know about you guys, but I feel like he could have did that after worship because I'm like, I'm choked up. Man, that's powerful. How powerful is that? Isn't that awesome? You know, these guys told me when they were adopting her about the problems and stuff, and I thought, wow, it, it takes a lot of faith to adopt a child knowing that what could or not knowing, I guess, what could be, but Jim was never in doubt his mind that this little girl's going to be perfect. But, all right, here we go. Jenny. 
There's nothing like having confidence in you. The whole world is looking for something, and Lord, it can only be found in you. Found in you, Jesus. You are our healer. You're our strength, our comfort. You're with us in the storm. You never leave nor forsake us, Jesus. We just love you. We thank you for the sweet spirit that's settled over this place. Lord, we ask the Holy Spirit to minister to those, each heart in this room, right where they're at today. Lord, only you know their pain and their sorrow and their battle. So we just ask you to continue to be with us as we uh, love you and serve you this morning. Lord, if we left you, we'd have absolutely nowhere to go, nowhere to turn. And there's a world in darkness outside these walls. And Lord, uh, we just need to, to gain the light, to be refreshed, renewed here. So when we leave, we can be the light that dispels that darkness through this next week to come. So Lord, be with us. We praise you. We give you glory and honor. And we do it all in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Shake a hand before you sit down. If you get around to uh, Tim compare it, shake his hand. He was 60 years old yesterday. Nelson, and uh, those of you that have uh, 
uh, belong to destiny here and have sent your kids to Cornerstone uh, Christian School down by Miriam. Uh, know this rascal. Uh, it was such a blessing for me to get the call. He was kind of hesitant, I think, but uh, he asked if he could come up and, and uh, talk a little bit about the school and, and uh, preach a message that God had laid in his heart. And I said, absolutely. So um, he's, a, he's a principal, new principal. Uh, this is going to be your first year as principal there at the Cornerstone Christian School. And uh, we uh, Karen and I have been blessed to go down there and, and serve and help them in several different ways. They've got uh, Dan's Fish Frying Tenderloin uh, Supper down there, and they do theaters and just all kinds of really cool stuff down there. And Karen and I really enjoy uh, going down there and serving. Uh, Adam graduated from Grace Theological Seminary. And after graduation, he moved to Franklin, Indiana, and he took a position as associate pastor down there. And then he was youth pastor as well. So uh, a lot of times when we get called into ministry, we uh, do it two, three, and four-fold and uh, without very little or very little recognition and pay. So uh, he was really uh, uh, blessed to have that. And it grew in him. Um, to be able to grow, uh, come back to Columbia City, and, and uh, he was a mental school coordinator and director uh, last year, and then he uh, he got the position of principal this year. And then uh, those of you that know Melissa and Rob, Melissa works there as the administrator. So um, he's going to talk to us a tad bit about the school, and uh, he's got a message that he wants to give us from the Lord this morning. He's been married for 13 years, and he said, I have three beautiful kids, 7, 11, and 13. And I thought, oh my gosh, a single dad, he adopted kids. He never mentioned his precious wife, Courtney, at all. So he walked in, I'm, I'm assuming they're married. I mean, he walked in this morning with her. No, they're married. But I, I just thought it was interesting how us men sometimes can overlook the most important part of our lives other than Jesus. So um, we're honored to have him with us this morning, and, and uh, the Lord's given us Adam today. I'm going to have him come up and uh, let you welcome him, and I'm going to pray over him, and he's going to give us what the Lord's laid on his heart this morning. Our Lord, I thank you for Adam. I thank you for the opportunity to get to know him closer and better. Uh, Lord, I'm sure he's got nerves that are just beyond imagination right now. But you uh, lay your peace, your, your calm spirit over him. Let him know that you're going to lead and guide him in truth because your word is truth. And uh, he's going to just bless each and every one of us with some uh, precious nugget to take away today. So Lord, uh, thank you for your word. We thank you that it never fails. And uh, it's going to be with us for eternity. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Everybody say amen. amen. Bless you, buddy. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Am I on? Yep. So, yeah, it was kind of interesting. Um, I remember my wife and I, we moved up here a few years ago, and we had started sending our kids to Cornerstone. And I had left the position being associate pastor and came up and we were kind of in transition because all of our kids were school age. So being a youth pastor worked out really well until all my kids were in school because all the times that I was off, I was doing youth ministry stuff and so I wasn't able to go see my kids' activities. So we kind of thought, hey, this is a good time to transition because I want to be a part of my kids' lives more. And you know, in youth ministry, you're busy every single weekend, you're on call. And so anyway, we move up here because uh, Courtney's family is all from the Cherubusco area. And she took a position at the time with Parkview. She's a nurse practitioner. And so that's a good career. So I had time to look around. So we were blessed by that. And it looked like I had a position to teach Old Testament uh, through Crossroads Bible College. I was going to be their professor. And, which is my, I love teaching the Old Testament. And my favorite thing about being a pastor is teaching the Bible. People was the most difficult part. <laughs> but I love teaching the Bible. And about a month before classes and all that, and I was going to get all that stuff, they called and said, we don't have the budget for it. So I didn't have a job. And right about that time, I saw a newsletter that <clears throat> Melissa had sent uh, home with the kids. It was like May saying, hey, we're going to be looking for somebody to 
be the middle school supervisor. And I was like, man, I hate school. But, <laughs> but that was kind of funny and ironic. And so I'm like, you know what, though? This will be an opportunity for me to kind of have my hand in my kids' education and get a pulse for what's going on. So I decided to kind of put my resume in and sat down with them. And I was hired to be the middle school supervisor. And I loved it this past year. And what was really crazy that I didn't recognize is that I get to teach the Bible Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And it's my favorite thing to do. So then they call me in, Pastor Dale and Melissa, and they said, what would you think about being the principal? My first thing was, do I still get to teach the Bible? And they're like, yeah. Except for instead of Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, we want it to be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Because I'll be doing the chapels now as well. So I was like, yeah, that sounds amazing. So I'm excited about it. With that being said, it's a very small school. If the Lord lays it on your heart to uh, support a ministry, uh, we definitely need it. Uh, we, you know, it's going to be tight with budget and whatnot. Um, but I don't want to be up here doing a sales pitch pulpit because whoever picked the songs for worship, that third song, I don't know, where's, where's he sitting? Who, who picked the songs for worship? The, the third song preaches this message to a T. I don't know if you guys end with worship. You could come up here and sing that song again to end. I mean, it is spot on. Um, so anyway... We'll get to that. We're going to be talking about today uh, Luke chapter 17. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. We're going to be in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19 today. And I want to talk about the miracle of Jesus healing ten lepers. So as you are turning there, I remember a few years ago there was a story online that went viral. In the story, it was, it was a video thing that you could watch, video video article thing. And what it showed was a young couple that they had, it was a serious couple. They had been dating for a long time. It looked like they were from China. If I remember right, they were from China. And they looked very wealthy. And so they'd been dating a while. Everybody knew the engagement, the proposal was coming. And this guy pulled out all the stops. He had sent out letters and invited family and friends to be at this big court area that he had rented out. He had hired dancers. I mean, he had paid a lot of money to pop the question. And so the time comes, and the lady, the young lady, is getting really excited. You see her put her hands over her face. She's so excited. He gets down on one knee, and, 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 on one knee and she's getting excited. And he opens the ring up, and then all of a sudden her face just totally changes. She sees the ring, and she doesn't know. She walks off. And everybody's stunned. And the lady ends up getting shamed really hard on social media for obvious reasons. Because even though our culture is pretty messed up, people still understand that a ring is just a ring and it's a thing, but it's a symbol, and it's a symbol of what stands behind the ring. It's just a blessing. It's just a gift. But the real gift is the man that stands behind the ring, because the marriage covenant is that you get that person for life, not a diamond. Amen. So, I want you to keep that story in mind. And it's pretty easy to see where she was way off. But how about us? How about our own fallen state? Let's focus on this a little bit. In life, we all have a tendency to be short-sighted. We focus on the healing, not on the healer. On the gift rather than the gift giver. On the miracle rather than the miracle worker. On the saving, hey, I get to go to heaven, not on the savior. That's one reason why that song was so powerful. Jesus, it's not about the blessings that you can give me, which, yeah, I'm excited about those, but you are the blessing. That's what heaven is. That is, you know, when, hey, Adam and Eve, don't eat of the apple, because when you do, when you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. They did die because they were separated from God at that point. The real gift is we get to be with Jesus. So, now we are at... Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19, and we're going to read it. And before I read it, the main point of today's message, um, as you read the story, a lot of people will focus on the miracle. You know, about two-thirds or about a third of the sermons will focus on the miracle. And then about the other two-thirds of sermons will focus on that you should show gratitude to God. And yes, both of those points are obviously in the text. But the main point is simply this. Jesus is everything. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So let's read the text, verses 11 through 19. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. 
They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Now, why did they stand at a distance? Old Testament law. If you were a leper, you were mandated that you had to stand at a distance. And depending on your translation and what town you're in and which direction the wind was going, they could have been up to 100 paces away. So think 100 paces, think football field. They're going to have to shout pretty loud, right? Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Why are, they, why are they waving their hands? Why are they trying to get his attention and calling out to him? Well, Jesus is known as a miracle worker at this point. And nobody denies that he does miracles. Rome has him recorded as a miracle worker. People that reject him as Messiah. Uh, Josephus, first century Jewish historian, records him as a miracle worker. Nobody could deny that he could heal and do miracles. It was just by whose power and authority he was doing it. So they're standing at a distance and they're calling out. In a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So what does Jesus do here? He heals ten men of leprosy. Okay? Well, let's get a context of what exactly that means. What is leprosy? The Greek term that's used in the text here is simply lepis. And it's just a general term for scaling in the Greek. Unbelievably, it actually can be a whole range of things. See, today, we're able to sit there and diagnose exactly... You know, we have all these different names for different diseases. This could be anything from a simple rash to psoriasis to vitiligo where you lose the pigmentation in your skin all the way down the spectrum to where you'd actually get cast out of a city and be, con be considered an umhara, an unclean, which is what we know as modern-day Hansen's disease. Universally, all scholars acknowledge that what this man had would have been known as modern-day Hansen's disease. It wouldn't have been a pigmentation issue. It wouldn't have been a rash. Because when you read through Leviticus 13, it talks about diagnosing them, how you diagnose what they have. And if it's one of those lesser skin diseases, you would just be set aside, and then you'd be allowed back into the community. These guys were considered unclean, and they were out. So they have modern-day Hansen's disease. Well, what is that? It is a contagious disease that comes from the bacteria of tuberculosis. And what it does, and there's still people that have it today, it is something that we can cure now. They did not have a cure in the first century for it. Okay? You got it, and it was like a death sentence. So what it does is it, what it first does is it attacks the small cells in your skin surface. And the interesting is, thing is, now we have a, a cure for it. But it's so stigmatized because people look at it as God's judgment on them that what people will tend to do is they'll cover it up and they'll hide it. Kind of like what people do with sin. Cover it up and hide it. The problem is with sin, and the problem is with this disease, is it doesn't just stay there, it progresses. You cover up and hide your sin, it's going to keep growing and growing. You need to expose it to the light. You cover up your leprosy, and what it does, it keeps growing. And it goes from the small cells in your skin surface to where you, and, it, and you start seeing like a peak. It gets discolored, pink patch, and you start not being able to feel. And it goes to your large nerves. And then you're in really big trouble. You might not be able to reverse it at this point. It's in your elbows, your wrists, your ankles and knees. And this is where you'll see, you can Google Hansen's disease, and I encourage you to do so. People's faces get furled, they call it, it looks like a lion. Your nose will rot and fall off. You're, you get foot drop because it attacks those nerves to where you can't feel anything. And here's the crazy thing. The disease itself is not what really does the damage. You do the damage to yourself. Because you don't feel anything. Which is a whole nother sermon about the gift of pain. Could you imagine... How we would live if we could never feel pain. I'd go and jump in a fire because how beautiful it is. Destroying my body all the time. Oh, I want to touch that. But there's a very real gift of pain. But anyway, you get clawed fingers. Things will rot and fall off. Uh, it attacks the nerves in the face to where you will no longer feel the need to blink because you don't feel it. So even a speck that gets in your eye. We don't think of what a gift it is to feel that. It gets annoying, but we get it out. Imagine that speck stays in there. A common trait of people that have this disease is they go blind. They don't remove the thing. They get something stuck in their shoe, and then they get an ulcer. 
and then they don't ever fix it or it re-tears and they don't feel it. And that's why limbs rot and fall off. And so you can go to modern day leper camps today and they, people talk about the stench because it's just rotting flesh and limbs falling off. This is a very disgusting, defiling, nasty disease that you would not want to wish on your worst enemy. So now we have a context, but wait a second, we don't have a full context. I've just told you the physical ailments of the disease. The worst part of it we haven't even talked about yet. The worst part of the disease, if you were, all of a sudden you got it and you want to cover it up, the reason you want to cover it up and hide it is because Leviticus 13 says that if you have this defiling skin disease, that you are cast out from society. So you think that your limbs rotting and this would be the worst. Yeah, that would be horrendous. But the worst part is you're cast out from all social contact. So put yourself in these men's sandals. You have ten men here. And all of a sudden you get this disease. And you go to the priest and they say, yeah, you have this disease, this defiling ailment. No more social contact. We're going to take your clothes. We're going to give you new clothes that are ripped. And then you're going to go around, and every time you're around anybody, you have to announce that you're unclean, that they're not allowed to touch you. You're not even allowed to be within 100 paces of anybody. Not only that, you're not allowed to be in town. You've got to be out of town. No, I mean, think about it. These are 10 men that literally had this happen to them in life. Imagine you got this diagnosis. Got anybody you love in your life? You cannot embrace them. No more laying in bed and reassuring your wife everything's going to be okay. No more bedtime stories with the kids. I mean, we saw the emotion of the family that came up here earlier. These are my girls. Can't touch your girls anymore. As a father, can't be there to protect them. To raise your boys, to show them what it looks like to be a respectable man. Be hard, wouldn't it, Rob? This really happened to these men. How hard how agonizing it must have been. The only people they could be around were other people in the same misery as themselves. People that you loved and needed most couldn't even be around them. This would have been awful. So remove from all social contact. Don't just take my word for it. The Jewish historian Josephus from the first century during this time, this is what he literally says about this disease. He stated that it was forbidden for a leper to come into the city at all or to live with any others as if they were, in effect, dead persons. Did you know this? The Bible uses leprosy to be a depiction of something in the Old Testament. It's a picture of sin. Think about it. There's a lot of illustrative correlations here. Sin like leprosy in the Bible times is incurable by man. You're born in iniquity. You're born in sin. I sin because I'm a sinner. There's nobody perfect. And I and you have a sin disease that there's nothing we can do to cure it. And sin must be atoned for. Sin like leprosy is disgusting and defiling. You know, even though we're in a fallen state, you ever found yourself in a position where all of a sudden uh, maybe you went to a party or you went somewhere and there was some like really nasty stuff going on? I've been there before where it's like, man, that's too much sin. And it's like, man, go walk the Vegas Strip and you're like, man, this is just gross. I've never been to Vegas, but imagine. Okay? Sin. You let sin grow and grow and grow and all of a sudden you'll see certain people in a, in a, certain, in a position in life I remember hearing certain people's testimony going, that's disgusting. I can't believe they went that far. But man, sin is disgusting and defiling. Sin, like leprosy, causes separation. You ever seen people that uh, are addicts? I remember when I was in high school, my father runs all the ministry for the rescue mission down in Indianapolis called Leo Mission. And one benefit of that is I got to work at the summer camp for about five summers going through high school and college. And attached to the summer camp, separate from it, but it was near it, these guys would cook the food, was addiction recovery. And I saw men from every walk of life, from doctors to teachers to anything. Respectful occupations, not so respectful occupations, but they all have one thing in common. They've done a lot of damage to their families through addiction. 
and this sin issue was causing separation and issues within the family. Sin definitely causes separation, just like leprosy. Sin, like leprosy, unless cured, ultimately causes death. Your sin disease. Right now, we have a little bit of God's grace in our life, right? But one day, if you're not right with Jesus, you'll be eternally separated from God. You don't know. And if these men were not cured of their defiling skin disease, they were separated from all that they loved. You grasp the weightiness of this? You and I have a sin disease and the wages that it earns is death and separation from God for all eternity. Think about it. Think about how bad hell would be. And God gives a lot of illustrations in Scripture about hell. He actually talks more about hell than he does heaven. Believe it or not. I don't want anybody to tell you hell's not real. A place of eternal torment. Gnashing of teeth. A place where the fire never goes out, but yet it's also a place of eternal darkness. So it's like you get the bad effects of fire without the good effects of fire. You don't get the light. Boy, you get the burning. But all of that falls short. I mean, I feel like God does this to just tell us how bad it's going to be. All that falls short of what the real bad part is. Just like leprosy, it's being separated from God. Yeah, you have all this torment stuff like leprosy, but the worst part was they're separated from those that they love. And just like that song, I don't need God's blessings. I just want to be with you sitting at your feet. The worst part of hell is going to be you don't get any you don't get anything you're created for to glorify Him and be with Him. Hell would be awful. So now that we have a context of what leprosy is in the Bible, we see that Jesus has saved these ten men from this horrific existence. But let's look at their response. Okay? We're going to deal with the first nine. We're going to assume that they're Jewish because the one that came back was a Samaritan. And if the other nine go back to the temple. So... These men would have wanted to go see the priest as soon as possible. If you know Old Testament law, Leviticus 13 talks about skin defilements. Leviticus 14 says if somebody is healed and cleansed, this is what you do to restore them. Okay? To make sure that they don't come back with a communicable disease and spread it. It took eight days. So imagine that you're in these guys' position. You're no longer allowed to be around anybody you love. And then a healer is going by and you call out to him. And he says, go to the priest. My first thing, why am I going to the priest? I'm not healed. I'm not allowed to go, actually. But by faith, I'm going to do it anyway. Because he's a healer. All right, I'm going. And as you're going, all of a sudden, maybe your nose had fallen off and your fingers had run off. And they just come back on. Now, miracle? That's actually the definition of miracle. A lot of people say, oh, look, this happened. It's a miracle. A miracle is something that cannot happen outside of God actually doing. And a lot of people miss that. Oh, this was a miracle. Well, okay. There were some odds there on some stuff. But fingers growing back. My son actually severed off part of his pinky. It's not growing back. Unless God divinely chooses to do so, which would be crazy cool. But I'm not counting on it, right? So they're going. And here's the thing. Jesus did not come to be a healer. He came to forgive sins. So they call and they say, you know, have pity on us. He goes, okay, go to the priest. And, and this is the way I look at it. I could be wrong. Go to the priest. You know, if that's what you want, healing, go to the priest. That's kind of the way I look at it. So they go, they're go. they going to the priest. And all of a sudden, your, your fingers are restored. Your, your foot that was, you know, maybe you were blind in an eye or both eyes. And you can see. You'd be blown away by what just happened. Only God can do that. This is a miracle. And you know what? I don't want to be too hard on the guys. I can understand. The nine, they go to the priest. And you'd want to go because it took eight days to be considered clean again. You had to go through three ceremonies. One on the first day, one on the seventh day, one on the eighth day. Because <coughs> they want to make sure that you're really clean. They'd have you like shave all your hair off so they could inspect your skin. You'd want to get back because all the things you've missed. Think about it. The birthdays. The little league games in our context. Embracing your wife or spouse. Think about it. How many of you guys have ever gone on a trip and been away from home for more than five days? You excited to get back home and see your loved ones? You can't wait. If you're like me, it's like, man, I just want to get on the plane and get home. Miss my family. 
you would want to go and start the process, the rituals they had to do as soon as physically possible because you love them and you miss them. So they made the mistake that so many people make today. They made a really good blessing of God the main thing and they walked away from Jesus. These nine Jewish men were so caught up in the healing that they missed the healer. Don't let that escape you. Jesus, who is God, was physically right there. And they walked away. So you'll see the priest. And you know what? I think if you asked them, what was the best day of your life? I think they would have said something along the lines of, the day I was healed. That was the best day of my life. See, a good thing becomes a bad thing when it becomes the main thing. How about us in everyday life? Do we get so caught up in our hobbies, our enjoyments, our sports, our kids' activities, that we miss the main point? Luke 14, 26 says this, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. What does Jesus mean by that? It's a comparison verse. Okay, He's going to say this literally just a few chapters away from this story. Um, am I really supposed to go around and hate my wife and my children? Of course not. There's a lot of other passages you can point to where he's calling us to love them. In fact, the more I love Jesus, the more I will love them. But it's a comparison. If you are going to put how much you love Jesus compared to how much you love your job, your kids, your spouse, it's not even something that can be compared. If you're going to make a comparison, it's love. He's so high up on your priority of love that it's as though you hate them. So, ask yourself this morning, do you worship God for who he is or what he can give you? I saw a picture online and it made me really sick. <clears throat> Maybe some of you guys shared it on Facebook, I don't know. But it's a picture of Jesus and he's kneeling down to a little girl and he's taking a little teddy bear from her. Has anybody seen that? And he goes, but you don't know what I have for you. And it's a big, large teddy bear behind his back. And she's all sad and emotional. I hate that picture. Jesus is the gift. God's right there. I don't care about a teddy bear. But that's our culture. What can we get? God's our mighty genie, our, our mighty gold platinum credit card. Get me whatever I want. When all we should want is him. Nine learned how to enjoy good gifts from God, but one learned how to enjoy God. So let's look at the response of the Samaritan. It says, verses 15 through 19 talk about it. It says that he came back and praised God in a loud voice, threw himself at his feet and thanked him. Jesus' response was, your faith has made you well. Okay. That's huge. The reason I say that's huge, when we read it in English, I mean, I really encourage people to go get a bunch of different English translations because you guys, when you understand the way languages work, there's not always a word-for-word -word correlation, so they have to make some interpretation for you. The literal rendering of the word, Jesus says, rise and go, your faith has made you well. The last word there, the literal word is sozo. It does not mean well. A literal translation of the word sozo means safe. So Jesus says, rise and go in the Greek, which is what he originally was speaking to. Rise and go, your faith has saved you. Wait a second. You go back. When he talks about cleansing them, he uses katharizo, to cleanse. If he's talking about the same thing in healing, he would have certainly used the same word. He'd used it twice before in the passage. Rise and go, your faith has cast katharizo. You've been made clean. 
He doesn't. He says, rise and go, your faith has sozo you. Sozo is where we get the root word for soteriology. Soteriology, if you go to seminary, it's the doctrine of salvation. So he uses the word, root word for salvation. Rise and go, your faith has saved you. I do not think Jesus is talking about just a physical healing at this point. He comes back praising God in a loud voice, throws himself at his feet, recognizing he's in front of God, that only God can do this. And God says to him, rise and go, your faith has saved you. See, the Samaritan received salvation because that day he came face to face, not just with the one that could heal his leprosy. No, he came face to face with the one who could forgive sins. God was right there. He's walking. He sees the miracle knows only God can do this. And he goes, I'm not going to miss God. Yeah, he's the priest being declared clean and seeing my loved ones can wait up against God. I'm going to go back and praise God. God was right there. And I think if you were to ask the Samaritan what was the best day of your life, I think he would have said something along the lines of, the day I met the man who could forgive sins. See, the main application of the Gospels is Jesus is not like you. He's wholly different than you. He's God. And these stories are to leave us in awe of who he is. The Gospels are all about Jesus. If you go back through some of the stories in Luke, I had written down about ten of them, and I took them out because it would take a while to get through it. So we're just going to focus, I think I have four left in here. We're just going to focus on these, and we're just going to hit them real quick. And I want to focus on, there's something that people tend to keep saying, and it is this question, who is this man? Because again, the Gospels are recorded, and they're all about Jesus. All the Old Testament testifies to one man, and that's Jesus. All the New Testament's pointing back to one man, that's Messiah, Jesus. And the Gospels, you're right in it, and it's talking and testifying about one man who we're created to give glory to, which is Jesus. And so you see in these stories this question arise, who is this man? If you look back at Luke 5, you can turn if you like, but we're just going to go through these very quickly. Luke 5, 12, we see Jesus actually heals another leper, ironically. Chapter 5, verse 12 is where that story starts. And what ends up happening is he doesn't tell him to go see the priest. He uses a different technique because he's God. He can do what he wants. He touches him. Whoa. If you know Old Testament law, you, you can't touch somebody that's unclean. Because you touch somebody that's unclean, now you're unclean. And he does something totally universal nobody's ever done before. Now the clean touches the unclean and makes the unclean clean. That had never happened before. You used to have to go to the priest to be declared clean and go through all these rituals in the Old Testament. Now all those rituals are in a man. And he touches him and he makes him clean. And you start seeing the question, who is this man? This is not a man. You ever wonder why he got crucified? It's not because he went around healing people. It's because he went around healing people and doing miracles and saying he was God. He got crucified for saying he's God. Blasphemy was his charge. So then you go a few verses over, chapter 5, verse 17. And the very next story you see is a group of men, by faith, taking their friend on a mat, and they lower him down. Remember that story through the roof? He's a paralytic. Guy can't walk. And he's known as a miracle worker that he can heal. And so you have the scribes and the Pharisees, the teachers of law, and they're sitting back going, okay, what's he going to do? Let's watch this. Let's watch this miracle. And he takes it a step further and really takes them off because he doesn't immediately say, you know, hey, yeah, your faith has made you well, rise and go. He says this first. He goes, your sins are forgiven you. That really ticked off the Pharisees and the scribes because then they start saying, I think it's verse 21, who is this man who commits blasphemy? Only God can forgive sins. See, when somebody sins against me, I, or if I sin against somebody, I don't care if you forgive me. I care if that person forgives me because my sin is between me and them. Jesus is sitting there. This is why only God can do it. Jesus is sitting there and saying, your sin is between you and me because I'm God. I forgive you your sins based on faith. So they get all upset about it. And then... You know, Jesus, being God, sees that they're upset about it. He goes, and he poses them a question. Well, what's harder to do? To tell a paralytic man to rise and, and go and walk? Heal him? Or to say your sins are forgiven you? So you, that you know I have the authority to do so. He just kind of trolls him. 
Go ahead and stand up. Go home. The guy gets up, takes his mat, and walks home. Which one's harder to do? To heal a man that's paralyzed or to forgive him of his, of his sins? Only God can do either one. I can do both. You can do neither. And they start saying, who is this man? Luke 7. Sinner woman washing Jesus' feet with tears in, in her, in, and her hair. The one who is forgiven much loves much. Remember that story? And Jesus says to her, he, says, he tells her that her sins are forgiven. And here's the interesting thing. He tells her the exact same thing. He says, your faith has sozo you. How do our English translator translate that verse? Right there you go. Your faith has saved you. They don't say your faith has made you well in that verse. It's the exact same Greek word. Interesting. Luke 10. End of the chapter. Mary and Martha. And this is a story you don't get it until you get it. And I remember not getting it. I remember reading it in high school and being like, I don't, I don't get it. Martha's opened her house and she's diligently working really hard. Remember, she goes to Jesus. Hey, have my sister help me. And I remember thinking, yeah, lazy Mary. She's just sitting there. You don't get it until you get it. Because Jesus is everything. Remember, Jesus says, you know, Mary has two choices, and she's chosen the better choice. God is right there. All of God. Why would you be doing anything else? Mary, just like the song, is just sitting at his feet. I just want to be with you, God. Wow. Who is this man? So let's do a quick heart check today. You get a good gift from God, and you guys understand that. All the gifts that we do get are sin-tinged. We live in a fallen world. To live is to suffer. You, everybody, if somebody's here like, hey, I haven't suffered, it's like, you're obviously really young. <laughs> Just wait. You will have suffering in this life. God is a good God. And he loves to give good gifts. But these gifts are going to deteriorate this life because we live in a sin-sick world and a sin-sick body. So God gives you a good gift. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your wealth. Maybe it's your health. And that gift, he allows to be taken from you. Or to go away. Maybe you get, maybe we'll go with health. Maybe you get diagnosed with stage four cancer. A tragedy occurs. A loved one in your family dies. And you lose faith. Why? Because your faith was in a gift, not in the fountain of all good gifts. So how does a Christ follower all ate up with cancer on their deathbed say, God is surely good? You know how? It's because he's learned not to cherish his health. He's learned not to cherish his wealth or his family. He's learned to cherish Christ as most precious. As these good gifts of our life start to deteriorate, we've got to remember to keep our eyes on the greatest gift, which is Christ, which cannot be taken from you. He's greater than his miracles. He's greater than his healings. He's greater than his blessings. He's greater than his creation. He's the creator. Have you come to a point in your life where you have learned to cherish Christ as most precious above all creation? Colossians 1, 15 through 18 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Jesus is top. Nothing above him, nothing else to gain. We pursue healing, we ask for healing, maybe we get it, maybe we don't. Jesus is enough. We've got to remember to be excited about the groom. 
not the ring, not the blessing. It's about him. It's about the groom. I'm so excited to be with him. My my health gets taken from me. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it'd be a really hard, hard, hard process. But there's also a joy knowing you get to be with him. That's why Paul was impossible. It's like, hey, if you don't stop teaching, teaching about Jesus, we're gonna we're gonna lock you up. Great, I get a captive audience. Well, okay, okay, well, then we'll kill you. Great, I get to go be with Christ. Well, then we won't kill you. Great, I get to proclaim his name to more people. I mean, there's nothing that can overcome you when you are on the solid ground of just pure love, just full love with Jesus. Anything that comes in your life, you can't conquer it. It's not about what Jesus gets you. It's just about Jesus, top of the chain, nothing else to want, nothing else to pursue. He's enough. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you're an awesome God. And we don't deserve a relationship with you. And we thank you that you stepped in and dealt with sin and gave us a way to be cleansed of our sin disease. That you made the payment. It's not like any like nobody made the payment. You just cleared the debt. You made the payment. And we thank you that you did that for us. I'm so excited to be with you for all eternity. And I pray that my brothers and sisters grow more and more in their love with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Alright. So, all I'll say is, yeah, I'm going to be the principal at Cornerstone. If you do want to give to a good ministry, we'd love to have your support. We um, don't take government aid, so we do rely on the charity of local church bodies and congregations. Um, but I don't want to do a sales pitch from the pulpit. But uh, I'd love to talk to you about this school out there. I'll be, be around for a little bit. Do you have any questions? Uh, so, why not? Before there we go. Wasn't that a good word? Yeah. I just want us to listen uh, to this song again. Adam's really uh, uh, touched on a, a beautiful principle and, and uh, word this morning. And, and I don't know about you all, but I know it was for me. Uh, it was really good. let them uh, sing that. And I just wanted to soak into our hearts and our spirits this morning. And uh, we'll pray and, and then release you.
You know, uh, I was just sitting there thinking when we were singing out. Try to get together. We were down to Dominican Republic, and it was lunchtime. And I, there was like 20 of us, 18 maybe. And I yelled out, who wants to pray over lunch? And everybody's standing there with their hands in their pockets, you know, looking around like, oh, he will. Hurt. And Cole comes walking across from the basketball court we were building. I said, Cole, you want to pray for lunch? Yep. Just walked right up there, let her rip. I mean the most beautiful prayer. A kid, and there's grown-ups standing there. I'm thinking, what's up with this? And uh, the missionary walked over to me and he says, listen, I don't know what you're doing at your church, but you keep it up. He said, that's the most awesome thing i ever seen. And I said, man, would I love to take the credit? Yeah. It's a Christian school he goes to. Church is priceless. God is priceless. And it's like Adam said, he's all we need. He's enough. And those kids are, are instilled in that. Like Adam said, man, I get to teach them the Bible. It works. Those little kids walk around spreading Jesus and they don't even know what they're doing. And we get in the way. Well, let me figure this out. You know what? I, that's scary. I don't feel like doing that. They just blow off their mouth and share Jesus. Childlike faith. We got to get back to that, church. We got to get back to it. And Adam, don't, don't take Adam wrong. He didn't call me to come here and talk about that Christian school. He came here to ask if he could preach. And I want to tell you what, I don't know about you, but I thought he did a really good job. And he'll say, no, I didn't. The Holy Spirit did. And he's right. When we're at Jesus' feet, he uses us all the time. So we're going to bless Adam for preaching today. Uh, we're not asking for money for that school. We're not asking for money for him. Not a dime. But if you guys, it, it's just like last week. Um, Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> the missionary was here. You guys gave him $1,000. And he bawled like a baby. He said, Mike, I came to visit. I said, you did. You visited Jesus, buddy. Because this group really blesses. So with that said, I, is, this, we're not asking for an offering for them or the school because you know how God's got his hand in favor on that place. You can hear it and see it. But if you feel like you want to mark something, just mark it. Mark it school, mark it Adam. Mark it Courtney that he left out that he's married to. <laughs> Whatever. <clears throat> but haven't you heard from God today? Yes. I, I just, uh, I've had on the sign out there that everything you need is found in Jesus. Or everything you're looking for. I, I put it up there long enough I forgot now. But it's the truth. And I went to take it down yesterday and I thought, no, I'm leaving it up there. And then what does he do? Come preach on it. And then you you thought about who picks the songs. I, I told him. I tell him every Sunday. It's the Holy Spirit. We never tell the worship team what to pick. And it goes with a message every week. No, I, I didn't ask him. He's, 
I, he didn't ask me what to preach, and I didn't tell him what to preach. I said, the Spirit needs to lead you. So thank you guys for uh, playing that again. I've got, my wife informed me that I got so excited about Adam, I forgot to do the announcements. We're going to work on the float at 2 o'clock. And we want everybody to know that we want you to walk along with that tomorrow. And we're... Uh, oh no, it's today. See, I get in I don't. I don't even know what day it is anymore. I'm serious. It's today. You can walk along. Um, we're going to hand out water too. We got 700 bottles of water. We're going to hand out this year. And Tammy has got the most awesome float picked out. And uh, Ryan brought the. Uh, trailer out here and we got to build a standard on the back today and get everything put up and we're going to go down there and we're just going to have a blast and, and share Jesus with people. Uh, Tammy's already planning on winning again so <laughs> share with other people. There you go, when Jesus is involved we always win. And then we're going to have a picnic next Sunday. We're going to put the big tent up out there. We're getting games and doing all kinds of stuff. Uh, we're going to do hamburgers and hot dogs and the drinks, and we want you to invite everybody in the city to come. And uh, we're going to have you carry in a dish, and then we're going to have the baptismal tank filled, and we're baptizing people. We've got several that have already committed. So if you're here and you don't know or you've never been baptized and you want to be baptized, we want you to get wet. He asked me, uh, what, what should I wear? And I said, well, what you got on is good enough. He's going to get baptized. And I said, the air will dry you off. So. But uh, whatever you need to do, just bring a towel and change your clothes, whatever. But all, you, all we ask is you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior. We had a little gal yesterday come to the pork burger sale and run up and give me a hug. And she said, I want to be baptized. So uh, we're just going to have a good time next week and relax with one another. But today we're going to share Jesus along that parade route, hand out water, and, and uh, just, just show people Jesus. And we want you to be a part of it. If you got a Destiny shirt or something, throw it on. And uh, we got it. Huh? We got to be at East Noble at five. Uh, I'm going to tell some of you with younger kids or in the heat, if you're older, like the 5:30 range, no later. And uh, then we're going to have to leave the, the parking lot at six, and we'll go up Park Avenue and turn into the fair by Christie and uh, Tom's house. And then there's going to be a surprise on your left when you get there. I want you to be looking for a surprise. And then we're going to go on on the track and, and finish handing our water out and get judged. And, and then we'll dismiss. So uh, if you're able to do that, we'd love to have you come back and be a part. Father, I thank you so much for the beautiful word you gave us through Adam today. What an awesome, blessed message we received. I pray uh, you continue to anoint him and use him. Uh, Lord, he's prepared. He's uh, done the best he knows how to do what he does. And Lord, we know that you're going to use him where he's strong and cover him where he's weak. And uh, he's going to be a good principal for that Christian school down there that we desperately need in this land. So, Lord, uh, I ask you to cover us today as we prepare the float and, and protect us as we're in the heat and walking. And, uh, Lord, just give us some uh, new, new friends and, and uh, relationships along the way that we can uh, show and, and teach and, and uh, give the love of Jesus to. Lord, go with us. Uh, let us be light in the darkness out there as we head into this next week. 
Uh, Lord, for those that are in the fair, we just pray a hedge of protection over them, that there's no... Uh, no uh, injury out there this week or, or any problems of great magnitude out there. And Lord, we know that you're going to be there because there are going to be a lot of us here that know Jesus and we're going to take him out to that fair this week. So Lord, bless us, use us, and we're going to give you all the glory and the honor and we do it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Give uh, Adam some love before you go.